I'm Gillian with Donald. This is Al Jazeera, live from London. Also coming up, strengthening ties. The French president holds Egypt's leader, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, in Paris. Human rights groups are depressed. Sending a message, Washington announces it's withdrawing military aid from Myanmar over its treatment of Rohingya Muslims. And Xi Jinping's political thought is enshrined in China's constitution, cementing his status as one of the most powerful leaders in the country's history. A very warm welcome to the program. The UN Secretary General has just touched down in Central African Republic, his first visit there since he took office in January. And Teonio Guterres says his visit is to draw attention to violence there, which he says is often ignored by the world's media. In August, the UN's aid chief warned that violent clashes in the country could soon become genocide. But inter-religious violence is not the only problem that Guterres has to address. Human rights activists say the UN isn't doing enough to prosecute French soldiers who've been accused of rape and sexual abuse. And for many victims, the wait for justice may never end, as Nicholas Hawke reports. Nadej was 13 years old when her family took refuge by a French military camp to escape the violence in her neighborhood. One of the soldiers asked her to fetch some water inside a tent. Thinking she was safe, she did as he asked. Two French soldiers grabbed me. They forced themselves inside of me. I screamed. They strangled me and covered my mouth. When they were done, they let me go. Human rights organizations believe several children, both boys and girls, were raped by French soldiers who were there to protect them. Some were forced to have sex with dogs and even took pictures of the act. France opened an investigation, but prosecutors dropped the cases saying there was not enough evidence to charge the soldiers involved. The French troops left in late 2016. Since, the violence and the displacement of people has intensified. It's left to the United Nations peacekeepers alone to bring back stability to this country with one mandate, protecting the civilian population. But a UN investigation revealed that some peacekeepers in Central African Republic are violating their mandate and sexually abusing girls. Daniela, not her real name, says she was gang raped by three Congolese peacekeepers in June. I don't feel good. I feel guilty. I'm scared to talk about it. I don't trust them anymore. Human rights groups fear there are many cases of sexual abuse by soldiers that go unreported. The new secretary general says he has zero tolerance for abuse. The UN is investigating cases and putting measures in place to prevent this from happening again. But so far, no one has been arrested or charged. If countries or organizations that claim to defend human rights and rights of women are unable to bring justice, then this will bring irreversible damage and may break the trust people have in these organizations. There's some comfort for Nadej from her father. It's not your fault. You're not to blame, he says. We love you. Someday, we will get justice. Egypt's president has met his French counterpart in Paris, where the two have pledged to strengthen economic and military ties. Abdel Fattah el-Sisi and Emmanuel Macron also discussed escalating violence in Libya, as well as security in the Middle East. Their meeting has been heavily criticized by activist groups, with protests being held. Reporters Without Borders are against France signing agreements with Egypt, claiming the government uses torture, represses journalists, and holds unfair trials. David Chater is in Paris. President Emmanuel Macron did make it clear at the uh, press conference after the long lunch with his Egyptian counterpart that he thought human rights uh, must be protected, uh, that uh, the, the fight against terrorism and the, the idea to protect security inside Egypt and beyond Egypt had to be fought within a framework of law, protecting things like the operation of non governmental organizations, uh, protecting civic society and making sure that human rights were respected. And he thought that uh, the Egyptian president should lead uh, his country 
on the path in his fight against terrorism within the framework of those laws and those rights. Uh, but the uh, Egyptian president himself uh, responded by saying that his main concern was to fight what he called the proliferation of terrorism within his country. He also denied that there was a, an epidemic of uh, torture by his security forces, uh, which was uh, plainly uh, uh, said within the reports of the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International at a press conference only yesterday. So he turned his back on the idea that there were severe abuses of human rights. And he said that also human rights in Egypt uh, also included things like having the right to education having the right to housing, having the right uh, to a job. So he, uh, he turned his back slightly on what uh, President Emmanuel Macron was saying and uh, seemed to be saying that uh, the, the situation within Egypt is not as bad as the human rights organizations were saying. So they've signed a, a cooperation agreement. Uh, the alliance between uh, France and Egypt seems as strong as ever. And it must be remembered, of course, that Egypt is the number one customer for France and its uh, military industrial complex. Well, Al Jazeera is demanding the release of its journalist Mahmoud Hussein, who's now been in prison in Egypt for more than 300 days. He's accused of broadcasting false news to spread chaos, which he and Al Jazeera strongly deny. Mahmoud has repeatedly complained of mistreatment in jail. He was arrested in December while visiting his family. Pakistan's Prime Minister has told America to the war against terror. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has held talks with Prime Minister Shadid Khan Abbasi and Pakistan's top military chief in Islamabad. Tillerson's visit comes just months after Washington accused Pakistan of helping the Afghan Taliban and fighters from the Haqqani network. Abbasi told Tillerson that his country's made progress in fighting the region's armed groups. Kenya's top court is going to hear a last-minute demand to suspend Thursday's rerun of the presidential election. It comes as Kenyan police fired tear gas and warning shots to break up a group of opposition protesters in the capital, Nairobi. Activists say a free and fair election can't be guaranteed after opposition leader Raila Odinga announced he would boycott the vote unless electoral reforms are put in place. A two-day conference is underway in Sicily, focusing on what's being described as the world's deadliest migrant crossing. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe says despite the risks, people are still making the dangerous journey across the Mediterranean to get to Europe, often on overcrowded and unstable boats. In 2017, the death toll remains unacceptably high with almost 2,800 victims. In addition to that, nobody can say how many people died while taking the similar dangerous land route through the Sahara. Against this backdrop, it is clearly in the interest of all parties concerned, not least of migrants themselves, to prevent irregular migration. Well, the migrant crisis has transformed parts of Sicily. Some areas on the Italian island are now a reminder of the risks people face trying to reach Europe. So to Abdul Hamid reports. The landscape of some of Sicily's most secluded beaches is changing. Since the middle of the summer, there are more and more abandoned boats coming from across the Mediterranean. Claudio Lombardo is an environmentalist who now spends his time documenting the arrivals of these migrant boats. Ninety-nine percent of the boats are Tunisia. Those on board are mainly North Africans, so they are economic migrants who would have no chance of getting residency. That's why they arrive in this way. They don't want to be recognized. We know little about them and they have total freedom here. Eighty boats are now stranded here, including this one that could have never made it across the sea alone. Authorities suspect a larger mothership somewhere at sea dispatching migrants in smaller numbers. People here call these the ghost boats. It takes 24 hours from the minute they leave Tunisia to when they arrive here in Sicily. And during that time, these boats go completely undetected. The minute they arrive, on shore, the people on board first as quickly as possible, and nobody knows how many they are, who they are, where they come from, or where they're going to. This is the usual pattern, running along the beach towards the hills, and from there onward to the mainland, 
all is trying to evade security forces. But with little or no control, there is concern that ISIL could be using this route to infiltrate Europe. I, I think it's uh, uh, quite plausible that these fighters will go somewhere. Uh, either they will go, go home or they will go elsewhere. I think we better be attentive. Law enforcement agents will have to uh, cope with this uh, specific challenge, and, th and that's a huge challenge. There is no doubt about it. Security is also a concern for people like Ilaria Cappello, who lives near the beach and often sees groups of migrants walk by her. It's very worrying. There are more and more people. Authorities should be doing background checks to identify them. The revival of the Tunisian route came after Italy and Libya reached an agreement to stem departures from the Libyan coast, underlying the challenge for Europe to face smugglers who continuously adapt to new realities on the ground. Hud Abdel Hamid, Al Jazeera, Sicily. Still to come on the program. Russia blocks the UN from extending an investigation into one of Syria's deadliest chemical attacks. Bringing music to the masses, the American orchestra that's hitting all of the right notes.